Hello. How is everybody? Hi. All right. Okay. So this is like crazy. Whoever designed this agenda for today, uh, I think did it deliberately to set up a team set of session. Uh, but that was perfect. Whoever did it, right? Which means that we have to be like really on time. So discussing. Um, so all right. Go ahead. Um, Sarah, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Sarah Scroggins. I am the director of brand marketing, so I partner very closely with Brad uh, and his team in bringing new products to life. So once he's come up with the great ideas, um, our team actually puts them into the market, and you know we go through the test process, we bring them to the device, bring all of the um, radio, videos, all the things to life to get people enticed and want to come in and keep them. All right, I'm Brad Burgess, Corporate Chef, Director of Media Innovation at Taco John's. I'm the one that creates the, the delicious food, bringing new consumer, bringing back our core consumer more often, and then I get to run a sweet swag. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've been doing these forums for 25 plus years. I have never had the opportunity to actually be on the panel with a chef. We are speaking with. So today is a delight to actually have a chef who's creating stuff, a marketer who's marketing all of this good stuff, right? So we get to hear both perspectives of how these work out. Um, this is Saraj Barwani, uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Lumen. I'm not going to go into this thing and see what Lumen is or whatever, I'm sure you can find out. We have our team here as well. Uh, there's only one liner on this thing. The world over the past 50 years has been divided. For the past 25 years, it's explicitly divided between advertising technology and marketing technology. The looming is just the two. That's it. That's the end of that message. Um, so, um, Brad, I'm really curious. Um, what does a chef, a chief chef, really do at a, at a brand like Coffee? I'd say we get to play around with food, which is the best part. Um, our team heavily focused on four different pillars. First one is innovation. As Barry mentioned, we want to take the innovation to Taco Bell. Second part is quality, and we do it with uh, full egg. Third pillar is flavor, you know, throwing in hatch chilies into our case of Blanco that we had launched. The last one is execution, and that's two parts. I want to make sure that what we're creating from a gold standard, we execute it within 50 seconds on the line for our team members. And the second part is that it's profitable for our franchise. So, Sarah, I mean, this is, this is an exciting environment to be working very close, right? So let's start at the very core. Who is the core audience for Taco Bell? That's a very interesting question. So our audience is definitely older. So we are trying to work through how do we continue to attract those younger consumers in. So that 18 to 34 year old group that's going to become brand loyalists, but then are going to have kids bring their kids in, they're going to become brand loyalists. How do we attract them in um, so that, you know, we're still relevant in 50 years? So we're really making sure that as we're looking at our consumer insights and the products that we're bringing forward, that we are attracting those younger consumers in and that we're exciting them and bringing those value gains to them and um, showing them the quality of products that we want, but also at a great price that entices them to come and spend their dollars. Perfect. So that leads me to you, uh, Brian. You don't mind because I'm going to have to bounce back and forth a little bit because you guys work so closely. I was so impressed when you were preparing. Like these guys are completing each other's sentences and we're so fascinating on the year. Um, so that goes to knowing that the audience who it is today versus where you are leading and what you're trying to bring in. What does that lead to in terms of the consumer trends, the emerging trends, and how that will influence the time in terms of the tastes from the generations that are potentially now versus that they're coming up for. Yeah, I would say one of the um, areas of opportunity that we saw when we came in is we're dealing with the big West palate. So they find ketchup kind of spicy. And I can't bring in things in terms of having a ketchup kind of palate. So what we've done from kind of a trend perspective is build our ingredients and test them in a way that I can dissect out within our insights 
in terms of spicy consumers. I'm big on pepper flavors. I come from a previous brand that delivered heavy on sauces in terms of wings and beer, and I'm bringing that into Taco John's. As I mentioned, we did hatch chicken, which are a case of Blanco. You'll see our hot sauce packets today. They have habanero puree and habanero powder within them. And it's these little nuances that I can put into the ingredients that, you know, I find influencing, but, you know, that I can bring into the new consumer point. So, go further on that, because given what you just said, how does that influence your strategy behind the menu? And so, go into the menu in terms of the item selection, the design, the layout, you know, all of that, because you have multiple experiences you're supporting right now, right? In the in-store, but also there's the drive-through and the pre-order, the whole thing for the app. So, how does that influence the way you design? I would say a couple of things is, you know, not touching our brain in terms of our potato always, our meat potato burrito, and our crispy uh, taco. As Barry mentioned, you know, we did a whole AP fit study around our quesadillas. We launched with four different cheeses and tripled in sales, which was fantastic. Next is we're looking at different vessels. So how do I take a crispy taco on a soft shell in a new form, but play on our brand inheritance on potato lay? One item in, in particular is in test in Minneapolis market, so cheddar crunch taco. So I thought, how can I take the potato lay into a taco form? We created a potato flatbread, topped with aged cheddar cheese, so you're kind of getting that nacho cheese dippable experience, and also added shredded potatoes on the outside, deep fried in house daily, and then added potato lay seasoning on top of it. Okay, now this is very interesting, right? And it's selling like crazy. <laughs> it's like you know, so uh, I was I was complaining earlier. We were just outside. And you know that you could walk in before, and I was saying, you know, as a kid growing up, loving tacos, you know, I always struggled eating the hard shell taco because it just fell apart. And I would start biting into the whole thing, and just like, and she caught me in that one. She says, "You're just not eating the right taco." <laughs> Please do not. <laughs> uh, so on that, um, uh, Sarah, talk about uh, what has been some of the best. I mean, you haven't been there that long. You've only been there for two or three, three years, years, right? Yeah. And so in that time, what has been some of your best like product promotions and things that you really think like, wow, that was so good? Yeah, I think so. I think the find that. So I made a major change over in the QSR space, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot more promotions, a lot more new things that you can bring to market. Ask, or, you know, sit down. It takes a lot longer to get things to market. We test things for two years and then finally you launch it. Um, so it's been a lot of fun to work on that. In terms of products that we've launched, I think the case of is a huge win for us. It was something that was very rooted in our consumer insights of hearing from consumers that we needed a better product. Uh, so we spent a lot of time working on that. We wanted to bring forward something that had four cheeses than our competitor. So we have four cheeses, they have three. But sauce can we bring forward to really make sure that it is a really flavorful product? And you know, and then we put our grilled chicken, our pan cut sirloin into it, and it's done super well for us. In the test, we saw three times the volume of quesadillas going out. It's continued to hold once we launched, and it's continuing to be a really huge success for us. Uh, right now, we have our promotional window that we're running through the event of my extension. And so we have our biggest quesadilla yet. Um, it is a hefty, hefty quesadilla that has those grain inheritance. We've got our beef in there in a double portion. Potato Olay is nacho cheese. It's super craveable. It's massive. And it's $4.99. And it's really resonating with that consumer that we want to attract. So that 18 to 34 year old. And it's really, really well for us. So, you know, you talk about um, new product, innovation, all of that obviously is the growth driver for you. Uh, you guys don't shy away from promotions either. I'm noticing you're doing all kinds of interesting things, right? Uh, but there is one thing that is catching people's attention, just in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has something to do with, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, so, Tell me about, first of all, the history of this. What and where did this thing come from, the whole Taco Tuesday? Come on. came from one of our franchisees. So it was something that they were offering. Uh, it was Taco Tuesday. 
So two tacos for two dollars. So obviously Taco Bell has mad us on that trademark. Uh, we did trademark it in 1989, uh, and then we brought that back that deal for our consumers to the end of the month. You know, we really want to embrace it. We are welcoming the challenge from Taco Bell, but we know that our tacos are better, and we're really excited to you know have the mentions and have the publicity, and hopefully get more people trying our tacos. So I'm just curious about one thing. So this is the one thing that I know I always fail, always consistently fail. I remember one day I went to see the CMO of uh, I Warner Over the Hunt Club and I Warner Videos. And they had an amazingly well oiled machine within what they call consumer drug market. Like this was from the Wonderman Times. They okay, developed these powerful offers to the Herbert of four books, four dollars. It was just a massively successful. And then when digital media came up, you know, I was one of the early ones. And they invited me to talk about, like, how do we do it better? I'm so worried. Like, it's hard to beat a control like that. And it's moving for 30 years to be so successful, right? So when I think of Taco Tuesday, my curiosity is, have you found any promotion that does better than the traffic you generate on Taco Tuesday? It completely shifts our menu mix on that day. It's hugely successful for us. It's something that the franchisees continue to embrace, and it's something that we do not plan to walk away from, I don't think, anytime soon. This is it. This is a very important lesson. Like, it's a humbling uh, experience for me over the past whatever number of years. It's just some things that we know that consumers love so much. It is hard to beat. You just have to go with the flow on that one, right? Um, one other thing. What are you doing in terms of your choice of channels to attract the needs of the consumer? Has your strategy changed substantially when the way you go up for them and so forth? I mean, it obviously is tied with your footprint and geolocations and things like that. Is there more that you can sort of shed light on that? I work with our media partner, uh, so our director of media, Matt Bard, and then also Corey, who you guys work with him later, um, kind of what that looks like. Um, I think it is something that all of us are very good to brand, and so there's still evolution there. There's still a lot more that we can do. And so it's something that we're continuing to always evolve, always listen, always go to things like this and learn from it, and then continue to bring forward new and big ideas in order to get the word out. Excellent. Brad, what has been the most difficult thing for you in the past three years? How you create something new, how you test it, and the whole value chain, what's the most hardest thing to do? I'd say for us was you know working on our legacy pigeons. So we have about 85% of our system that you know have pigeons from 1975, and our new kitchen legs you'll see a long time in terms of new innovation. So how do I blend when I create ingredients to work off of legacy equipments and future new equipment? Um, and secondly, you know, COVID. For the past year and a half, we were doing secondary sourcing versus actual innovation on new products. And ensuring what we were secondary sourcing was at the same quality, if not higher, than what we had uh, previously. Uh, Sarah, is it better to have more people coming into the city than more people doing drive through or vice versa? I just like them coming through. But. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think drive-thrus, especially if we're making sure that we're working on our speed of service, there's more opportunity to see more people. Um, you know, dining rooms only have so much space, but anyway that they want to experience Dr. John, we are open to and ready for it. Are there certain things that you've been doing on the menu that gets people to really do more drive through versus the other? Are there other changes you've done that actually you would prefer that not being experienced? I really just think that COVID changed a lot of things. You know, drive through really, it really shifted to the drive throughs and it's going to stay that way for most QS brands. So, I don't know that we've necessarily changed our strategy. Um, we are doing some other things in terms of the, you know, our field being it's on lot um, to tell them about our promotions through the drive throughs. They have speaker wrap that really communicates and shouts loudly uh, what our new limited time product is, what that promotional window is. But in terms of shifting them over from indoor to out, or from Dine in to drive through. I don't know that we necessarily really try to shift them uh, again. Anywhere that they want to dine with us, we're welcoming it. Understood. Understood. 
Okay, I can keep going by the way. I have tons of questions, but I want to open this up a little bit here if people have any questions regarding what these guys are trying to do. Yeah, I didn't really ask uh, Sarah. Would you mind restating the question? Oh, yeah. So the question was: Is how are we using our insights in order to kind of figure out what we want to test? Can I summarize? Okay. Um, so in terms of insights, you know, it is very much you know, Brad is always looking at uh, different industry trends, things that are happening with competitors. What are the opportunities that we can bring forward for us? So is there something that is really popular at another brand, and we can put our spin on it, we magnify it. Make it something else, Taco John's. Um, so using that, and then I, you know, we do a lot of work with our consumer insights team on you know concept screens to see what people are interested in. We put a lot of different things out there in order to kind of gauge interest. There's things like a fruity pebble burrito that's one out. It didn't go forward, but you know, there's a lot of fun things that we put forward to just, just see because you never know. Um, and then from there, we really are able to align it and then we do what we call a consumer location test. And so a really great thing about this office is we're able to bring the consumers in here. We're able to do it more frequently. They're able to try the products. They're able to experience it, get their feedback. Uh, Brown and his team are the ones that are preparing it. So we get that real-time feedback from consumers around what is exciting to them. And then from there, we bring that into a market test and really get the consumer insights into how does it perform within the restaurant and then how do our consumers, are consumers willing to buy it. So they might love it during the CLT, but are they continuing to come back and buy it? That's a big question. And so that's what right now we're doing with the Cheddar Fresh Taco. Um, I've been in Minneapolis Market, so if you're up here, you can get that taco that he talked about um, for a couple more months. So it's going along. We're hopefully, getting it uh, extended. But it, you know, right now that's in test. We're getting a lot of really great ratings out of it, and we're really excited to have to watch that system out later. <laughs> Very much. So we have what we call an advertising production council uh, that is made up of um, six franchisees, six of the franchisees, it kind of varies. Um, we do tastings with them to bring them along. Last week we had a, I think it was two and a half hour tasting with them to show them all the products. We can show about 20 different things that we are excited about and bringing forward. We really are open to sharing our concept results. Um, as well as our CLC results, and just continue that conversation. Um, I think they all have our cell phone numbers, and they're calling us all the time. Um, Gary, in particular, I get some of them too. But you know, it's a partnership. But what is exciting? They're the ones that are in the restaurants. They're the ones that are engaging with the consumers. And what is what are they seeing in terms of trends that we could bring forward? So it's very much a partnership between us, um, not what we're bringing forward. You mentioned that quality is. Think about menu development, like the elevated quality of your food. How do you balance the tension of quality and value in the service? Yeah, I'd say from our development and our software, we do it on the manufacturing model. And ensuring that, you know, when I create something, I throw in like one or two unique quality cues, like I mentioned the habanero puree, the pepper hot sauce, our chimichurri sour cream, you know, has fresh uh, cilantro and fresh uh, parsley that's freeze-dried at the manufacturing level and put in there. Um, and our grilled chicken. We created a chicken that is uh, a cilantro lime marinated and then we put it through a process where it gets grilled and has that couple of star marks on it. Yes. Yes. I 
depends on the product. Um, so there are different approaches. So for a limited time product, um, we would just be putting it into a market. We typically sit there, we're smaller, so we go around 20 to 30 locations um, that we are validating over anywhere from a six to eight week period um, in order to get learnings. If it's going on the core menu, we then move into what we call a sustained period, where we're putting it on the menu, making sure that it really is earning its spot on the menu. Is it still holding that you know, sales mix that we're looking for once it goes off of broadcast? Um, and then that typically, if it's going on the core menu, we'll sit there a little bit longer, maybe like a couple promotional windows in order to make sure that it really helps deserve its spot. And then from there, we do move pretty quickly into you know, um, a national launch. So we could be testing the same year that we are launching for an LTO. The joys of a smaller brand. <laughs> um, so, so kind of Not necessarily. We are, however, going through um, some sort of on the quality quality side of things. So we are working with the consumer insights team on both qualitative and quantitative research with our consumers around what do they want from us as a brand. So what are we doing right now that we need to get credit for and need to talk about louder, frying our shells fresh every day, fresh made pico de gallo, hand cut sirloin steaks. What are that what is that that we're doing right now and what are the things that we need to be bringing forward because it's important to our consumers. So I think coming out of that work we will see some evolutions and things that we want to take on as a brand. Um, because we know we always want to make sure that we're attracting new consumers in and really focused on what they want from a brand. Yeah, I'd also probably touch on that as well. Uh, probably the main one from a protein standpoint is X. Um, you know, we committed to X by 2025, and we're about 25% there. And, you know, hopefully at that time, we'll be 75% you know, of the enrollment choice. Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so right now we're really seeing that our breakfast and lunch day part are doing really well for us. So we're really focused on our dinner day part right now and what, what do we need to do in that space. Um, so that's kind of where we are currently. Um, breakfast has been doing really well for us. It is, you know, easy to eat on the go. We've got these great burritos that have all the things that everybody loves, eggs and potatoes. Uh, very filling, for sure, but it's very portable. So that's doing really well. Lunch is really easy, you know, with tacos, it's kind of goes hand in hand. But then how do we bring forward consumers into the dining room to bring their families in to, you know, have those larger occasions and during the dinner day part. So we're working on that right now and it's definitely something that I think there's more work to be done for sure. Well, that was a very good question actually. That is true that day parts matter. That if you look at the coffee business, that again, uh, like just two hours between two and four o'clock is an amazingly challenging window. They're really trying hard to figure out what to do, right? That's sort of another question. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of people who are looking at the question, maybe why do you think it's good? I want to say we're not wasting time. Our beans are fantastic, and I'd say it's one of the hardest ingredients for us to put on our menu. Because our consumers are strictly, you know, meat and potatoes, and that's it. And how do we get those crack beans in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, 
going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. He works very much more on it. Um, I'm more on the food side of things and bringing it to life, but we're pretty, um, obviously, continuing to just look for opportunities to grow. I mean, we're very much in the Midwest footprint. We're in smaller towns, and so getting it to some of those bigger cities is really exciting. Uh, it also brings different consumers, though. So it is also bringing some interesting insights into what is attractive to those consumers. And so we are definitely having to shift how we're thinking about things as we kind of grow as a brand. Just to build on that, um, one of the interesting things we're finding is that historically we've been a rural brand, right? We, I mean, we started in a small town in the upper Midwest. And as we moved to suburban locations, you know, we've seen success. Uh, uh, we'll be testing in Boston, urban locations. So, uh, you know, right on the Freedom Trail there in Boston, opening a new location where our, there is no drive through. It looks and acts more like a fast casual concept and competing with uh, Chipotle and uh, Smashburger across the street. So, you know, we, we believe the brand has legs, not only uh, further east, but also up market. And so these are some of the learnings we get from these new locations. That's the dairy and that was some little car and footprint is about 350, right? How big is your footprint today? Yes. Yeah. We're at 370 locations today. Um, but, you know, our, you know, like I say, we believe that within the next yeah, years, we'd be 600, you know, and, and really competing with, you know, Del Taco, we're kind of that number two spot in, in Mexican quick serve. Again, we believe that the, the white space for this brand is, uh, in every city in America, and so you know that, that's our ambition. I'm from the Boston area. That's why I'm asking you. I guess there's not. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it doesn't. You <laughs> All right. With that. Thank you so much.